Detective John Mitchell was a seasoned veteran of the police force, with over 20 years of experience under his belt. John Mitchell was a tall, broad-holder man in his mid-fifties, with graying hair and a stern look. He had an unonsane's approach to his job, and was known for his razor shop intuition and detective skills. He had seen it all in his 20 years on the force, from petty crimes to the most brutal of murders. He had seen it all, or so he thought. The detective received a call to investigate a murder of a young woman named Sarah Johnson, who lived alone in a small apartment on the outskirts of the city. When Detective Mitchell arrived at the scene, he was immediately struck by the sheer brutality of the crime. Sarah's apartment was in shambles, with furniture overturned and belongings scattered about. The walls and floors were splattered with blood, and the air was thick with the metallic scent of death. Sarah Johnson was found with multiple stab wounds. The cause of death was determined to be a result of these stab wounds. Personal items belonging to Sarah Johnson, such as a diary and jewelry, which were untouched by the killer. In the corner of the room, near the window, a small, intricately carved wooden medallion was discovered. It was carved with a unique symbol that was unlike anything the police had seen before. John takes the medallion with him as it may be related with the crime. The neighbors were questioned about their movements and any suspicious activity they may have observed around the time of the murder. One neighbor reported seeing a person loitering near the entrance to Sarah's apartment building around the time of the murder. This person was described as wearing a hooded sweatshirt and gloves, and they appeared to be trying to avoid being seen. Several other neighbors reported seeing a car parked in the area around the time of the murder, but no one could provide a clear description of the make and model. Despite Mitchell's efforts, nothing conclusive was found this day. Detective John Mitchell was sitting in his office, surrounded by piles of case files and notes related to the Sarah Johnson murder. He was deep in thought when there was a knock at the door. He looked up to see a man in a well-pressed suit. Detective Mitchell, my name is Brando White. I am a reporter with the local news, and I was hoping to ask you a few questions about the Sarah Johnson case, the man said, a friendly smile on his face. John sighed, rubbing his eyes. He was used to the media attention that high-profile cases like this one attracted, but he was still feeling the pressure of trying to solve the case and bring the killer to justice. Sure, I will answer a few questions, but I cannot give you any specifics about the case, John said, gesturing for the reporter to take a seat. Of course, I understand, Brando said, settling into the chair across from John. Can you tell us what you think the motivations behind this murder might be? John leaned back in his chair, considering the question. It is still early in the investigation, but we believe that this was a crime of opportunity. The killer may have seen Sarah Johnson and followed her home, then broke into her apartment and attacked her. Brando nodded scribbling notes on his pad. And do you have any leads or suspects in the case? Unfortunately, no. We are still following up on all the leads we have, and we are working with the local community to try to get any information that might help us solve the case, John said. I see. Well, thank you for your time, detective. I appreciate it, Brando said, getting to his feet. John nodded, watching as the reporter gathered his equipment and left the office. 
Five weeks after the murder of Sarah Johnson, another woman was found murdered in similar circumstances. The victim was identified as to 5 yerold Amanda Wilson, a nurse who lived alone in a nearby apartment. Amanda Wilson was murdered late at night, round midnight. The authorities were alerted by a neighbor who heard loud noises coming from Amanda's apartment. When they arrived at the scene, they found Amanda's lifeless body with multiple wounds from a sharp object. The crime scene was chaotic, with furniture overturned and objects scattered all over the floor. Blood was everywhere, and it appeared that Amanda had struggled with her attacker. The killer had broken into Amanda's apartment through a window and entered her bedroom. The room was in disarray, with furniture and belongings knocked over and scattered across the floor. The bed where Amanda was found was stained with blood, and her body was lying in a twisted position, indicating a violent struggle. One strange clue found at Amanda Wilson's crime scene was a small, intricately carved wooden figurine. It was found placed near Amanda's body, and it was unlike anything the police had seen before. The figurine was about three inches tall, and it was carved in the likeness of a mysterious, hooded figure. Beside the figurine was also one ring, with intricate symbols and markings etched into the metal. John took the ring and the figurine as evidence. As John began to investigate the murder of Amanda Wilson, he talked to her neighbors to see if they had seen or heard anything unusual the night of the crime. According to the neighbors, Amanda was a quiet and reserved person who kept to herself, so it was surprising when they heard loud noises and screams coming from her apartment that evening. One neighbor, an elderly woman, reported seeing a figure running from Amanda's building shortly after the noises and screams started. Another neighbor, a young man who lived directly below Amanda's apartment, reported hearing a loud thud on his ceiling, followed by the sounds of someone running and then everything went silent. Despite their efforts to investigate the crime scene, the police were unable to find any concrete evidence that could lead to the killer's identity. All they had was a few eyewitness accounts in the ring and carved wooden figurine that were found near Amanda's body, which they initially thought were just pieces of trinkets. However, John was intrigued about the strange items that were found in the crime scenes. As John searched for more information about the medallion, the carved wooden figurine and the ring, he stumbled upon a mysterious antique shop in the heart of the city. The shopkeeper was known for selling strange and unusual items, and John thought he might have some information about the items he was looking for. John approached the shopkeeper and asked about the items. The shopkeeper raised an eyebrow and asked why John was so interested in these items. John explained his investigation into the recent murders and how he had found the medallion and the figurine at the crime scenes. The shop owner behavior suddenly changed, and he began to speak in hushed tones. He told John that the medallion and the carved wooden figurine were connected to an ancient and powerful ritual, one that involved the sacrificing of lives in order to obtain eternal life. He warned John that the items were dangerous and should not be taken lightly. The shopkeeper began to explain about the ancient ritual was known as the Rite of Immortality and according to legend, the ritual required the use of the medallion, along with other two sacred artifacts one carved wooden figurine and an ancient ring. The medallion symbolizes each step of the rite and the transfer of power from the sacrifices to the performer of the ritual. The figurine is said to represent the power of life and death, 
and its presence in the ritual is necessary for the performer to unlock the power of the medallion and obtain eternal life. The ring is believed to symbolize the completion and fulfillment of the ritual. It is said that the person performing the ritual must have the ring on their finger in order to fully harness the power of the medallion and receive eternal life. The ring represents the ultimate prize, the reward for completing the ritual by sacrificing multiple lives and gathering all three sacred artifacts the medallion, the carved wooden figurine, and the ring. The items must stay near the victim before their death as to transfer the essence to the item. These items transfer the life essence to the first person that touched it after the death of the victim. The last victim must have absorbed the essence of the others, touching all the items, in order to fulfill the ritual. As the shopkeeper finished telling the story of the rite of immortality, John felt a shiver run down his spine. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. All the pieces were starting to fall into place and the picture that was forming was chilling. John suddenly realized that he was the next target of the killer. He had come into contact with the medallion at Sarah Johnson's crime scene. Also, have contact with the carved wooden figurine and the ring from Amanda Wilson's crime scene. The killer was after him. John quickly gathered his things and rushed out of the shop. He had to get to a safe place and figure out how to protect himself. He knew that he was in grave danger, and that the killer was getting closer with each passing day. He had to act fast if he was going to stay alive. John immediately went to his home think about the whole situation. As John entered his home, he noticed that something seemed off. He couldn't quite put his finger on it, but it felt as though something had been moved or disturbed. He felt a creeping sense of unease as he walked through his living room, cautiously checking for any signs of intrusion. He went straight to the kitchen, looking for a glass of water to calm his nerves. As he reached for a cup, he noticed that something was off. One of the cups looked different, as if it had been moved or tampered with. Despite his suspicion, John drank the water from the cup, not wanting to show any sign of fear to the potential killer. But as soon as the liquid touched his lips, he knew that something was wrong. A bitter, metallic taste filled his mouth, and he realized that he had just ingested poison. Just as John was about to collapse, Brando appeared from the shadows, revealing himself as the killer. John mustered all his strength and engaged in a physical struggle with Brando. Despite being weakened from the poison, John managed to hold his own and was determined to bring the killer to justice. The two men fought fiercely, exchanging blows and grappling with each other. Eventually, John managed to gain the upper hand and overpowered Brando. He quickly called the authorities and had the killer arrested. With the perpetrator in custody, John was able to finally breathe a sigh of relief. He had narrowly escaped death and was able to bring the killer to justice.